You're listening to the Minutes on Growth podcast, the show that brings you mindfully curated insights into relationships, spirituality, personal development, and everything in between with your host, Tanaz the same for. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Minutes on Growth. Today, I have the wonderful Arzu from Inspire Zoo, my college friend of over a decade, a yoga and meditation instructor and retreat leader and so much more, but we'll dive into that um, in the episode. Welcome, Arzu. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an amazing journey as we've witnessed ourselves grow throughout the decade. I know it's crazy. I was just thinking that like two students of poli sci and international relations that we've ended up in completely different areas. Like how crazy is that? Yeah. And honestly, it's crazy. But I, when I look back on it, I shouldn't even be surprised just because this was always my life journey. And you remember like from freshman year, I was always teaching yoga. And yeah, it's just amazing how our soul always knows the way to go. Amazing. I mean, you started yoga at the age of seven, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like how, how can a seven-year-old kid get into yoga? Yes, I did start yoga when I was seven. And I actually started meditation when I was five. So it was like amazing to have parents that were really liberal and open minded. We both have Persian parents, which is something that really bonded us when we were in college. And I'm really grateful that they realize the importance of spirituality and the grounding tools growing up in Los Angeles. There's a lot of superficiality as there is in any city. And so um, they introduced me to Kundalini Yoga and they would take me twice a week, no matter what, whether I had a lot of tests and I always went and it created an amazing discipline and my soul was just yearning more and more for that deep knowledge. And that kind of led me to when I was 14, signing up and doing the teacher training course. And you were the youngest teacher to be trained in Kundalini, right? Yeah, I became the youngest teacher. That's crazy. How did you feel as like a seven, eight-year-old going and like being on the mat? Like what did the mat represent to you back then and what does it represent to you right now? Hmm, that's such a beautiful question. I've never had that asked. I guess the mat was self-care. The mat was honoring my soul and honoring the peace that is present when you slow down and you just are present with yourself. And as a kid, we're so intuitive. And I find that as we grow up, we're so conditioned and we need to now as we adult uncondition ourselves. And so that kid in me loved being on the mat because I felt so nourished and I was tapping into that intuitive soul that was there all along. And I honestly you know, fast forward 20 years and I, the mat still represents that for me, but it's evolved into so much more of a physical practice as well as mantras and chanting and so many other self-care practices. Whereas in before it was very meditative and meditation is the root of why we even do yoga. So I'm really lucky that I learned it from the root up. Whereas I think more and more now, pros and cons of yoga trending is that you kind of maybe you go to a spin class and they have a like a yoga spin fusion or a boxing yoga fusion and then you dabble yourself into like a fitness style yoga class and then over the years you'll find yourself in the root practice of it amazing amazing so there's a lot of talk about like incorporating meditation into the school programs for young kids do you think based on your personal experience, it's easy to teach kids meditation or do you think that like kids don't have the attention span? Like what are your thoughts on, on that since you went through it? So I personally love teaching kids. I, because I walked through that, as you said, I was that kid and I physically and just, I felt the difference and the amazing benefits. I love working with kids. I have firsthand noticed how effective it is. I'm certified in teaching kids yoga, as well as I did a whole training course on specifically teaching inner city and incarcerated kids and the youth in all over the world that I work a lot with Compton and schools out here in California. 
And the results are phenomenal. I have private clients who's, you know, the mom would call me and they're like, my daughter's five years old. She has so much anxiety. She's not even eating. She's performing really badly at school due to all the anxiety. And I think, you know, we were really lucky not to grow up with social media all the time and all the screens. And now it's added so much more pressure. And it's unfortunately showing up as anxiety in kids at a really young age. And so I started working with this kid. She couldn't sit for more than a minute. The mom was like, oh, she probably won't. Every mother always tells me my, my kid will probably not do yoga, but sure, come and try once. And I'm like, okay, just give me one try. And every time without fail, the whole hour will go by and they're floored. They're like, how? And again, as I said, as a kid, it just feels so nourishing. There's a part of them that just thrives and connects so deeply with it. And so, you know, I start with a minute and we add and add in the meditation. And I work with a lot of ADD kids, autism, and I've worked up to like 11 minutes, which is what we do in Kundalini Yoga is an 11 minute meditation. And it's beautiful. I mean, for me, it's the most rewarding experience to witness that. And another mom was like, my kid does your breathing exercises in school, like in the middle of class when she gets triggered. Because, you know, no one wants to be called on. And then like, all of a sudden, you're like hot flashing, you're sweating, you're shaking. So it's just having these tools in your toolbox, like immediately ready to use is transformational. And I... I'm so grateful and blessed to be able to start teaching that, but I really hope and pray that schools have it in every school and every demographic. I was just talking to a friend in India who works with the slums and the kids there, and they have excelled the kids that are in like private schools, for example, just through learning the meditation tools and the tips. So there's no doubt about how efficient and how incredibly beneficial it is. Wow, up to 11 minutes. That's crazy. Like adults can't even do that sometimes. So that's amazing. Do you tell them that this is meditation or do they name it something else? So when I teach kids yoga, I have, and I think because I'm so young still, like I can make it really fun and I'm such a kid at heart. Moms always assume that I have like four kids because I'm super natural with kids, but I name everything really fun names. And there's the bunny breath, which are like the incremental breaths. There's the snake breath, which is the calming sound. And the meditation, I do call it meditation, but it depends on the age, right? Like if I'm working with a four to five-year-old, six-year-old, I'll be like, okay, let's just sit with our thoughts. Let's start to breathe. We're gonna, and I introduce mantras, which is so helpful for them because they're focusing on sound. As they grow older, I definitely tell them it's meditation. And I have this one mother, she has four kids and she'll send me videos all the time. She's like, my kids won't stop doing the meditation you taught them. Like they're just doing it all the time now. And it's, it's really amazing. That's so amazing. That's so cool. I feel like if every kid meditated more and played on the iPad less, we'd have much more centered kids. And, and we need that, right? Because the world, as you said, we were lucky to go through a phase where we didn't really have social media. We were like in our late teenage years when Facebook came. So we weren't exposed to that. But these kids are exposed to so much. And sometimes it can feel so overwhelming. As adults, it can feel overwhelming. So I can't even imagine what kids are feeling. So to have this tool in their toolbox, I feel like they need it. Yeah. And actually exactly what you're saying is very similar to a quote from Dalai Lama, where he said, if every eight-year-old learns to meditate, we can wipe out violence in the next generation. And that's in my mind, like truly the answer to world peace and how we can really change. And I know you and I are very, very passionate about humanitarian efforts. And that's really why I feel so much passion to work with kids because they really are a future. And if they have these tools in their toolbox, self-love, self-acceptance, I mean, I really am when I work with kids, I infuse so many life skills into each class. Respect, body awareness, like trust, so many things that they can learn through the practice of yoga. And so um, my goal, if anyone's listening on here and has a corporate company that could fund, I just want to like go out into those, you know, nonprofit, into those inner city schools and teach. But there's only so much time in the day and I just um, can only volunteer as many hours in the day that I can. So I'm, I've actually 
started to reach out to a lot of corporations to kind of be that middle person and, you know, have, if they want to have a social responsibility and a cause that they're donating to, I'm more than happy to be that middle person to go out there and work with the kids because it's, it's life-changing for them and for all of us. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you for what you're doing. It's, I mean, that's wonderful. So why Kundalini? Why Kundalini meditation? Why Kundalini yoga? Why, why specialize in Kundalini? So uh, Kundalini yoga was obviously something my soul maybe pr- picked. If some people think you know, we pick our, our parents, everything is, there's no coincidences, but you know, that's what they introduced me to. And um, as I grew older, of course, I, I, I have trainings in vinyasa and hatha and 10 other styles of yoga, but Kundalini has always been my favorite. It's the root of my teachings and it's very unique. It's considered the yoga of awareness and Kundalini yoga was brought to America in 1968 by Yogi Bhajan and he taught it because he said, we need these teachings to handle the Aquarian age. And that's when everything flips upside down. And for those listening, this is during the COVID time and we're all like our whole world is upside down. And so this is really now more than ever before when the Kundalini teachings are needed the most. And it really explores your potential of a, as a human being. It's in, incorporating such a wide variety of teachings using kriyas, angles of the body, meditation exercises, pranayama, breath exercises, mudras, mantras to have a specific end goal result. So in Kundalini Yoga, every Kriya is something that you're doing for a specific outcome and you know puts physical and mental changes into motion to see those results, I find quite immediately. So uh, I know that you just joined one of my recent courses and you got to firsthand experience it. How was it? Yeah. Oh my God. I was just going to say, because I mean, I've meditated so much like guided meditation, transcendent meditation, but Kundalini meditation was so different for me. I had so many visions. Um, Like I remember right after the meditation, I like ran to my partner and I was like, we need to go to Bali. I ha- like there is something there. I need to find it. I think I either have to buy a house. Like something is there for me, and I feel that that is the next step in my journey. And he's like, like that's so random. Like why did you just think of that? I was like, I didn't think of it. It just came to me in my visions. And over the next, um, I mean, we did it for forty days together in your course. Every single week, I had a different vision, and like some of them, of course, smaller that were more like. Uh, I was able to do them right then. And I saw so much progress uh, spiritually, uh, physically, mentally. So it was it was really life-changing. And I told everyone about it. I was like, you need to try Kundalini. Like it's different. I'm, I mean, I'm all for guided meditations and different types of meditation. But Kundalini, I feel like it's the next level. Like it's it's, I don't think it can get any better than that after Uh, you've like done all the other types so can you tell us a little bit about the benefits of like are there any specific short-term or long-term benefits I know that you said like there you can use an outcome like a specific outcome for kundalini and that's I've noticed that you have done that with your courses like one is for kundalini for abundance kundalini for health Uh, so what besides the outcomes what other benefits are there so yeah so as you said there the benefits are specifically for the kriyas but overall it really awakens a full potential of a human and and it connects us to a vast the universal consciousness and humanity at large you know using these mantras ancient sounds of the planetary system the universal system sounds of the creator of god in different forms of however you consider that it really expands your awareness to your unlimited self and clears any inner dualities creating power to really deeply listen, to cultivate inner stillness. And at the end of the day, obviously Kundalini is known for awakening, like everyone knows of Kundalini awakening. I think sometimes people might join for an immediate wanting that instant gratification up and awakening. And that takes time and it takes a lot of diligence and discipline and consistency and commitment. 
But Kundalini Yoga, of course, really does work on the, so we have the nadis, the channels in the body, and Ida and Pingala are the left and the right, but in the middle is the Sushumna nadi, which is your awakening, right? And so when the energy moves up the Sushumna channel, you have an awakening experience. And of course, Kundalini Yoga as you said, is the top. I'm, I'm biased as, and I think it is as well because it really is the next level. You're really putting yourself in, in the space to have these profound experiences, the visions that you were saying you're having. That, and I, I mean, a lot of the Kriyas that I, you might remember that I taught, you, you feel your hands are shaking. You feel the vibration of energy right then and there and you know there's a kriya that i love teaching called waking up the brain and it clears the electromagnetic field it boosts your lymphatic system your nervous system your endocrine system like you're working on so many things through one kriya one movement so i think it's it's one of a kind it's amazing it's so amazing so if anyone is listening definitely try out kundalini yoga life-changing okay so you're also a brain specialist like what what is that what does that mean like give us some insight it sounds so cool so I became a brain specialist, which is actually full circle with you and I going into international affairs because I always wanted to do work in the philanthropy world. But then I followed my passion of yoga and meditation and just let that guide me. And so there's a nonprofit organization called the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. And they have taken a Kundalini meditation and UCLA and many leading medical schools in America have been doing research on it and they were able to show the benefits of meditation. And so now they're offering courses to become a brain specialist to really understand you know, diet, physical, spiritual, sleep, all of the things we need to do to support our brain. And it became a perfect opportunity for me to be working on a cause, you know, an epidemic like Alzheimer's, where every 66 seconds someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's and 75% of those people are women. My grandfather had Alzheimer's and it's something very close to heart. And it's also something that bridges my love for yoga and meditation, as well as knowing I'm doing something for a greater cause. And so, yeah, I took the course. I'm a specialist. I go on tours all over the world. I've taught at so houses all over the world and different corporations that really want to have the science behind spirituality. I think it's for people more left brained or they're like, oh, spirituality, very woo 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 woo, you know, it's really fascinating for them to see brain scans and to see the visuals of before and after. So it's a, it's a, it's a game changer. And I think that this is, we're moving forward in humanity where we can actually have that to back up what we've been doing for centuries, but now we can really show for it. Oh, wow. That's so cool. And I, and I agree with some people when you show them the science and usually people who are very like masculine oriented, where like logic oriented, they need it. They need to hear about the science. And uh, that's amazing. Can you tell me a little bit why 55% are women? Like, is there a specific reason? Like that, that number troubles me. So actually I think it's 75%. So it's a very troublesome number. I I don't know if you heard 55, but yeah, so it's two thirds. And we're all asking that same question. I'm also an ambassador for Maria Shriver's organization called Women's Alzheimer's Movement. And that's dedicated to literally understanding and figuring out why women. There's a lot of research right now. There's not enough answers, but some people say it's because they're hormones. Some people say... Yeah, I mean, stay tuned. I'll, we're 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 starting to find out, and we're starting to learn why. There's jokes about you know, women's brains are going a mile a minute. We work, we're we're really always thinking, always doing. But we'll see what the real results are. There's a a research that the Alzheimer's Foundation's doing called the Pink Brain Project, and so they're doing control groups, and we're starting to learn more and more why. But sleep is very important. <laughs> that's 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 crazy. So actually, I was gonna I was gonna end with this question of like you said, every sixty six seconds someone gets Alzheimer's. How can we incorporate a meditation practice into our routine to kind of prevent that from happening? Like 
like what are some steps that we can take practical steps that we can like incorporate right now into our life so practical steps as you said it's super key to make sure that they're practical because if we try to bite off more than we can chew we will most likely not end up doing it at all and that's something that I talk a lot about in the course and making sure it's something that you guys can commit to the meditation specifically that we did the research on that's like literally proven to reverse memory loss also helps with anxiety 63% of the depression declined your anti-aging genes your telomerosis were increased so there's just a lot of benefits and I highly recommend if someone's new to meditation meditation to try these types of meditations because we're using mantra and mudras, which helps your mind focus. But the question was how to help with anxiety. I, I got sidetracked talking about it. No, how to uh, prevent getting Alzheimer's, like what the practice oh. was on it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm like, I could talk about this stuff for hours. So how to prevent, obviously sleep is really important. So we want to get seven to eight hours of sleep. But the second biggest thing is stress. Stress is the biggest cause of any and every disease and epidemic that we really have right now. So um, the majority. So to lower stress, we should meditate because it downregulates the parasympathetic nervous system. If meditation isn't for you, also pranayama, breath work, those are also really great exercises. Something that's really easy that I always tell people, you know, if you're driving, whenever you're triggered, the four, seven, eight breath is becoming super common and you're doubling your exhale to your inhale, which is immediately soothing and calming the nervous system. So you just really want to catch yourself when you are in a moment of stress and come back. You also want to start training your brain. So, you know, any type of coordinative like dance is working on your coordination. Boxing is working on your coordination, it's working on your brain, working on your mind. That's really helpful for Alzheimer's prevention. Again, the meditation that we did the research on, it's called Kirtan Kriya. That's incredibly beneficial for that. And yeah, just taking care of your well-being, you know, turmeric, any anti-inflammatory diet. Um, there's a lot of research talking about an intermittent fasting that is really helpful for the brain health, decreasing your sugar intake. Uh, I'm a I, I'm obsessed with monk fruit sugar as a replacement. So if you're like me with a big sweet tooth, there's this company called Lecanto and I love their products because it's a fruit, but it tastes like sugar and you could use it as a replacement. So just finding ways to not drastically change your lifestyle, but in practical ways, implement implement a healthy lifestyle. Affirmations is also another really great one. I talked a lot about it on my course and just to have like playlists that if anyone's listening and they want to have a playlist, I could send it to you guys where it just includes positive tunes, affirmations that when you wake up, you start putting that out into the universe and you're reminding yourself and yeah, just repetition, repetition, repetition until it becomes mastery. I love that repetition until it becomes mastery. I really like that. I came up with it on the spot. Really? It was so good. You should write it down. (laughs) I always like whenever I have these brilliant moments, I WhatsApp it to myself. I'm like, keep it in like on track. (laughs) Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing so much wisdom and insights into Kundalini, into how the brain works, into meditation and introducing kids to it at an early age and all the other wonderful things you talked about, it was it was really great. Whenever you talk, I always feel like you have so much to share and I appreciate that. So thank you so thank much you. for being on this. Thank you so much. Yeah, if anyone's listening, thanks to COVID. I mean, I've been able to pivot and really offer this all online. So kids yoga, corporate, all of the private sessions, everything is via Zoom lately. So no matter where you live, it's the same. So I'm happy to serve and continue to for us to collaborate. And I'm so excited for our, all of our upcoming virtual retreats and however we can always come together to support uplifting humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave your details in the podcast for anyone that wants to reach out to you, which I highly recommend everyone to do. So amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope to see you soon. Thank you for joining us this week on Minutes on Growth. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, then make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now.